Um, can, can, Simon, can you sort out yeah. this camera because it keeps drifting downwards? In a second. Cool. Where is the drift? Is it in that? Um, so it's in the vertical. Yeah, so that's this. It's um, it's not that. It's, it's this thing. Cool. So just give me some of Yeah, we got. It's only just top. Has that? That's on as tight as. That's slightly better, isn't it? No. <coughs> okay, that's fine. Support the camera, I'm just going to move the tripod up a bit. <laughs> oh yes, do you want me to... How do you want me to line the shot? Um, so... With the slide? Yeah, with the slide. We have 92 minutes, by the way. Stay this side. Wait, it's still still just here. <coughs> it's not that. It is that. It's just that. Is the camera too far forward? Maybe. The, the that seems better. Still drifting slightly. It's so it's in my bag over there. Have I got a minute? Maybe we should start now really. Is that okay?
So, as I'll do, um, I give credit to some of the slides here to James, who's at the back of the room. He's going to, he's going to give me a few graphs to do. And my presentation is running away with me already. No credits. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we focus on energy optimization. So the project called the Magic Project, Jeremy just introduced that, and we'll talk to that later. So these are things I'm not going to cover now, but I'm very interested in, so I'm interested in talking about them later. So this is the talk I'm going to give. We're going to talk about why I want to measure energy, and we're going to talk about energy power, and how they're related. We're going to talk about measuring power efficiently, um, and how well we can measure so what is the accuracy we should aim for if we want to design a measurement system? <clears throat> and then I'm going to introduce our open measurement design, which is available and we'll download and play with in our workshop. And then we'll wrap up. So let's we'll start with why we want to measure energy at all. <clears throat> well, why do we care? Uh, we care for a bunch of reasons now. Uh, Jeremy gave you the idea about power stations being closing, closed, but um, uh, there's more fundamental things. Most of our electronic devices building now are mobile, distributed devices. They're often run from a battery source or any stuff. You have a battery, you have a fixed amount of energy in your system. It's the capacity of the battery. When it has run out, then you have to change the battery or the stop. So that's a very finite supply. So the more you can make efficient use of that, the longer you can run your computing device well. It comes at a cost. Uh, you know, a billion dollars for Google. Well, it comes at a cost even for me. You know, I make this decision about whether to turn my server on and off at night, because I can say, the good proportion of my electricity bill. Um, but that's not generally made aware to the consumer. And so what we want to do is to make it aware to programmers that when they have their programming choices, they can see differences in the output of their code. <coughs> and then actively make a choice to produce more. <coughs> so that's about energy. We're also going to talk about power. And devices are now also limited amounts of power. So not just a total amount of energy they can take, but then how quickly they're going to display power. And there's some really good reasons for that. There are cooling limitations. Um, so my phone, which I just left at the back there, has a cooling limit of 2.5 watts. If I use any more power than that, I'll burn the hand of the user, and they'll see. So this is a design constraint. I can't buy a limit. I can get past this a little bit, I can drill holes, and then I get about 3 watts, 3.5 three watts. Um, after that, I will burn the user again. So that's a real hard limit. <coughs> that's human to be too. Um, we've got battery efficiency. So as you increase the amount of power you take out of the battery, it becomes less efficient. So the total energy available in the system reduces if you take it at a faster rate. And that's accounting. <coughs> so we care about power, so we'd like to reduce it. And then there's cost. If I have a system that has a bigger power supply, because I need to take more peak power, the highest power that I'm going to take, it will cost me more to build that power supply and the power supply will be bigger. And that has a cost and miniaturization. So these are really good reasons to worry about both energy and power. <coughs> in everything that we do. Um, so, we just get straight the fundamentals here. We have energy, which is this physical quantity that measures the work available to do in the system, or the work that we've done in the system. Um, and that we can relate to the amount of computation that we can perform. So there's some efficiency of computation compared to the amount of energy put in. And if you said that was fixed, then if you've got more energy, you do more computation. <coughs> in electronics, um, the energy goes as heat, and it heats up. That's how we lose the energy. So your battery turns into a portable electric heater, and that's what happens in your, in your devices. In winter time, I put my hands over on this side of my laptop with a nice warm feeling. And that's how we use the energy. 
So this is physical quantity, and this is the limit of the mass we'll ever do today, but we'll have a little bit of mass of this all. Um, so we've got energy E, and we've related to power. So power is this rate of change um, of energy, and so I can perform this integral. And this will turn out to be very useful later when we want to do energy measurement, because what we can do is do power measurement from the integration, and then we get other power. <coughs> and both have these use expressions. I've shown you use cases where you need to limit energy and also where you want to limit power. So that's why it's nice to be able to do that. <coughs> um, so to give you an idea about how this works in practice, what you actually do is you make a series of measurements. And so here is a scenario where you make power measurements over time. And what you gain are little thin bars. And there's a reason there's a gap between these bars, and that's that typically what you do is measurements and there's a rest period when you calibrate the next measurement and then you read that in. So you get gaps, <coughs> and you get instantaneous measures. So you don't get the full continuous knowledge. <coughs> but you get this idea. So you get the idea here is the system is taking a bit of power and then take less power. And it varies around it. You can convert that easily into energy. If you have that set of measurements, you've got a set of power measurements now through time. You can say lots of things about power consumption of the device. You can also then perform the integration process, which just measures the area under the curve. And now you have energy. So the volume under the curve, the area under the curve is the energy, and the measurements of power. So you get both at once. You just measure the power, and you have everything you need for energy, and more. <coughs> so energy is typically that ultimate metric that you want to measure, because you want to maximize your battery life. Um, and you can say some things that are nice. Um, if you know the amount of energy in your battery, you know the amount of energy your computation takes, you could say things like, well, I have 10 minutes more video time with energy. And that's kind of it's very useful to a, a user of the device. You can say, OK, well, you can hear you watching the film, but you won't get to the end. And then you won't be able to make a phone call either. So that's a choice you can actually make. Well, I don't care about phone call. I wonder what's going on in the phone. But <coughs> well, there's a big problem in computer science, which is that now we produce many applications that don't terminate. This is all the things that things like APC systems, where you have a big computation, it runs, some amount of time and then get results back. But most devices now, embedded devices, just run kind of forever or best ever in a loop. So sensors will never terminate. Um, little device can run my toaster, they never terminate. It's on to turn, it's, turn, it's checking the button and it's been pressed. And so you can't actually measure the total energy of the application because it never finishes. And if you sat around to it, you get the universe. <coughs> so for this point of view, uh, it actually makes more sense in process to measure the power because then you get an idea of what's going on right now. And you can, of course, collect the power measurements and say, this is the range I care about. Do the integration of the curve I just did. And then um, you know by the system. <coughs> so the power is the thing we want to measure. So we have the option. We could have measured energy directly. But very even power turns out to be more generic and useful. We can get energy. We can also get more information. And we can do with programs that don't tell you. <coughs> and thankfully, it's easier to measure as well. So it's a win-win situation here. So that's what we do. That's what we choose to measure in a modern computing system. We'll measure the power it takes, and then do the maths later. <coughs> so what we're going to do now is just go a quick bit into the fundamentals of where the energy is going, um, where the power is being dissipated, and uh, then go on to show how we can measure all this. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we're going to just we call a little bit of kind of schoolboy physics. Um, we've got Joule's first law, which says the power of my system is the current of my system, I um, squared times the resistance of the system. Okay, so if I have current and resistance, I can measure power. And so that suffices to know if I can fix the resistance, which is the thing that I probably want to do in this scenario, then I only have to measure current. I measure one thing, I know one thing, and I can measure the power of the system. <coughs> the problem is, that if you apply this to a computer, the resistance changes, the effective resistance it changes depending on what's happening. So that R is no longer fixed. Um, so I can measure the current potentially, but the resistance I don't know. It'll be different whether I'm doing one instruction to another instruction to whether some of the sleep mode and my sleep mode. I can't measure that. <coughs> um, so one thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy Ohm's law to just rearrange a bunch of these terms in the expression. And what you see here is basically I can rearrange these things any way I like. So I can look for voltage based on the current and the resistance of a system. I can um, look for resistance based on the over the current. And I can start substituting in for various terms of joules. So if I combine the two laws together, I can get to 
this one here, if it doesn't require me to know any resistance in my system. So that means that if I could measure the voltage and the current at the same time, then I'll be able to derive the power of that and to know any resistance. I do know the resistance, so I'm going to measure it. And so this means that you have a choice of how to do measurements, because we can choose which is the easiest thing in a particular scenario to do. Um, and we can get away with a measurement one of those. So we're going to come back to that when we show how to build the system. Um, but now we remember resistance capacitors um, and say these are the things fundamentally take um, the energy of computation. So I'm going to talk about an area called dynamic power dissipation here, which is the thing that isn't just I've got a slab of silicon and I'm warming it up by just having a voltage across it. That's another part of the influence of the other circuit. But this is what happens when we do computation. We, we use these elements and uh, they dissipate. So here's my transistor. This is a modern MOSFET type transistor. The symbol on the left, and this is a very simplified diagram of what it looks like, what it used to look like maybe 20 years ago, but now it's this will be jagged all over the place due to wonderful um, effect physics. <coughs> so we've got two different types of silicon, two dopings of silicon here. <coughs> and the idea is that this transistor will be able to be switched according to a voltage on the gate here. And if it's switched on, current passes between these two blocks of N type silicon. And when it's switched off, current's not allowed able to pass through that area of the channel. And this block is on that side turns off. So this is a device you can turn on, you can turn off based on the voltage on the gate. <coughs> and if you move the force from the gate, you will dissipate power. Why? Well, the first thing is, these essentially, if you think of one point of view, the sort of two materials, they're separated together in the arm. So, whenever, well, I'm going to build a capacitor. So this is a lovely parallel structure. That's how we, our industry has done so well, making these big, mass-produced, very flat devices. So I've got a big parallel structure, so what I've built myself is a parallel plate capacitor. <coughs> and it's about as long as the transistor. <coughs> so if I change the voltages at any point in the circuit, I actually start charging and discharging the crust pieces at that part of the circuit. So that means that I have to do some work. I'm going to go to the next bit. Um, the other thing that happens here is that uh, we have resistance. It is a semiconductor. The word semi is in there, it's not great conductor, it has a resistance, an appreciable resistance. <coughs> and so when I try and turn this thing on, and I pass current between the source and the drain, there's resistance in between. <coughs> and that resistance uh, is seen in the channel, mainly, and that contributes power. And the reason it contributes power is if we just look back at the, um, Ohm's law and Joule's law, um, we had a voltage across the resistor, that was the channel, and I had a resistance. And therefore, it dissipates power. And that power is squared. And this is one reason it's so good to treat computer chips. If you treat computer chips, you can reduce the current to go through, and just the power comes from one distance. So that's one effect. The other effect is the capacitance, which I think. Um, we can also look at the capacitor here, which is the in the transistor. And the capacitor is related to this equation here. This is the charge, which is essentially. Uh, measures energy and the capacitor sign voltage. So whenever I change the voltage on my transistor, I change the charge in the capacitance structures, and that means that I change the power. And the energy here is just how often I charge and discharge it. So whenever I change the value on a transistor, I display power. Whenever the transistor is on, I display power. So there's a bunch of ways that I can display power. <coughs> To give you an idea, here's a circuit, this is a full adder circuit, and he recognizes it. Um, this adds together two one bit numbers and takes a pair So the basic case of circuit you'll find in the heart of any microprocessor. <coughs> so if red says that this is a high value, so this is a lot of one, the black one's going to be zeros, this is the path of high voltage through my circuit. Okay, so it takes some path between the inputs and the outputs, and it charges up a bunch of transistors in the various gates to which it's attached. So there you go, wang, I've taken some energy. We look at the output there, um, from that first tool gate, once I apply another high input, it changes from red to blue, blue here meaning a low voltage. So the voltage there changed, so it went from there to there, 
And as it changed, it swung the full voltage of my power supply. Whatever that voltage is, probably one volt in one device. And so it charged and discharged faster by a volt. And so we now consume power by that. <coughs> so that's the reason that we use the energy. And there's a further effect, which is down to, here's a converter, there's a single um, input, single output, and you get the opposite of what you put in. Um, if you build this device, you build it out of two transistors, and you have to arrange transistors in such a way that they are connected together. And when you change the value on this, and only really when you change the value, for a moment you turn on both of your transistors, at least partially. When that happens, you actually connect together your power supply momentarily. And that's a short circuit, and that just spends a large amount of power, but for a very short amount of time. <coughs> so these are the reasons that um, we consume power, fundamentally, in the device. <coughs> so we can look at what influences the rate of power consumption. So I showed you that with the capacitors, in particular, the faster you change the values, you'll, the more you'll discharge and charge the capacitor. So if you've got faster clock, for example, you will change the values more often. You have faster changing the flipping of the values and wires, and in one second you would then do more charge discharging and you dissipate more power. Okay, any questions about this part? Alright, so okay, fine, so we understand all this, how are we going to use it to measure the power of the Let's get on with it. Well, we can measure, you saw we measure power with voltage and current at the same time, or resistance and current. Um, you can measure voltage is really easy, really, really easy. You buy a multimeter, probably euros, bad multimeter, and you can stick it on and you can measure voltage to reasonable accuracy. You buy an expensive multimeter and you get really good accuracy. You can buy an oscilloscope off the shelf and you can attach this and measure voltage with really good accuracy. Um, and you do all of these things, but it's fairly clunky and um, only partially automated. One, the strategy we use is to use a thing called the analog digital converter, which is built into a very large number of uh, off-the-shelf mm -hmm. devices in the embedded space, particularly. And we can make use of the to measure all of for us. So here's the, the high-level block diagram. So uh, the ADC, this is a block of a microprocessor, like this ARM-based microprocessor we have on here. Um, I'm not that one. But any bin you can think of produces this FPGA sampling everything. Um, so, you apply a voltage in to an input from the ADC, give it a reference, you know, ground, zero volts, <coughs> and it measures that voltage for you, and it gives you out a digital value. And it gives you some resolution, so 12 bits is quite common, resolution, and there you have your number. You now have measured voltage, you've got a digital representation, you can store it in files. <coughs> Typically these things work up to about 2.5 volts in an embedded device. Um, and so any volts which are doing that volts, you can just measure that. Does it consume enough power to affect the measurement, or is it very efficient? It consumes a huge amount of power. Um, but I have a, a, a short slide about that later. But the ADC is actually one of the most power hungry components of any device. And um, you'll find them in the as well. Um, so what we do actually with the boards, the, the, the workshop, the open book design, is we separate this out and separate board. So they have separate boards, but you don't care about the power that board uses. Um, in order to it's a beam's time so it's not affecting the results as well. It's what the beam time over the on the vector. Yes, the beam is, is virtually infinite. In fact, when it's, when it's measuring, it's infinite because it's disconnected internally. Mm -hmm. So they have, a, they have a sample followed by a conversion mechanism. So the beam is quite good. Well, yes, they're really powerful. You can see, uh, there's a demo I think you might use later where you turn on the ADC and you can see the energy consumption board. So this is a big disadvantage, but if you have a separate device, then it's okay. It's a great question. Um, one of the problems that we encounter, though, is that um, these devices typically work with about 2.5 volts. It seems to be an okay, industry standard. Um, and often your power supplies may be higher voltages. Right? They may be 5 volts, 3 volts, 240 volts. Who knows? <coughs> Now, we can actually do some really simple electronics to bring down any higher voltage into that measurement frame. And this is the, the obvious thing to do. The first thing we want to do we build this picture called a potential divider. It uses two resistors, and that allows us to drop a high range of voltages into a small frame. And it's determined by the equation that's up there, and V out is the voltage in times its ratio of resistors. So if we want to halve the voltage range, so we have 0 to 5 volts. 
we've got two identical resistors in that we'll get to zero to the power of the time. And then we bring in the range of the units. So that's that's fine, that's nice and easy. Um, and we will we'll do that when we need to. <coughs> Uh, one of the problems with this design is you get this current flow through the resistance. You basically put another tap between the power supplies. And so uh, you have to account for that. So if this power supply here is the power supply that you care about, so the microprocessor you're measuring, then you're actually adding current onto its, onto its current. And that means you'll get a false result about the power consumption. It'll be off by the amount of current that goes through there. But thankfully, these are fixed resistors. You pick them you know, off the shelf, and they have values. So you can account for that, but you've just got to remember to adjust your results. Your process actually takes less current than you thought it did, because you're wasting current in your measurement. And this is the kind of thing that can affect results if you're not careful about it. You've got to remember to do it. There's nothing hard, but you don't do it, you'll get errors. Um, that is the one that is the battle time. Right, So what we do now is we want to measure current. Most commonly is we measure the voltage band. And we use Ohm's law in order to transform the measurement of current into a measurement of voltage in a known resistance. The I squared R relationship. So we use Ohm's law. And um, what we'll do is we'll place a known resistance across a power supply. So if we don't here, I've got a microprocessor supply here. There's the main power supply coming out of my battery. And I place a known resistance in that wire. <coughs> then what I do is I get a small voltage appears across the resistor based on how much current flows, and I can measure that. But it's a differential thing, so what I have to do is actually pass it through um, the thing that measures the difference in voltages rather than the absolute voltages before passing it on to the ADC. And this guy is called the differential amplifier. So he takes the voltage here at the top on the red line, minus the voltage on the blue line, and that's the output. <coughs> So you can you don't care whether this is five volts or three volts, it's going to be a difference across the system. It's directly proportional to the the um, current. The problem with this approach is that this resistor you have to put it into your power supply somehow. And that's about how you spend a lot of our free time. But it's an invasive mechanism. If it's not already there, which probably will be, um, then you've got to insert. And you've got to pick the right kind of resistance value so that you don't stop circuit working. If you've got a really big resistor in the power supply, you just can't supply enough power to the microprocessor, and the microprocessor will fall over. If you have it too small, you get a very, very small voltage appearing across the resistor, it's very hard to measure. Tiny volt, 0.00 or something. Volts. <coughs> so you need to select carefully. Um, here's my guidelines. Um, well, most every microprocessor will deal with up to 0.05 volts change in the power supply without care. It's normally specified in the data sheet that that's an absolutely fine range to be in. <coughs> and so, um, if you want to maintain that as a maximum drop across your power supply, these resistor values, which happen to be exactly the same as the ones on our measurement board, uh, uh, are in cover this range, which is the range of typical microprocessor. So, anything from uh, microprocessor takes microwatts and then up to something that's going to take a full amp. And some of the more powerful arm boards we have taken take over that one. And so, this range, which a resistor gives you the allowed voltage drop, but it is still very small. So what you're now doing is feeding this kind of voltage into the ADC converter in a microprocessor, which has a range of 0 to 2.5 volts. So you're using some tiny, tiny part of that range. What you want to do is to maximize the part of the range that you use, because that gives you more resolution, gives you more um, points inside the range that you can distribute. So what we do is we actually amplify in the analog domain the voltages that we see. So we don't just create that differential voltage we also amplify it at the same time. And the thing that we do is we amplify by a factor of 50, 
and it maps and scales up 0 0.0 to 5 volts into 2.5 volts. So we can then cover the exact range that the ADC is sensitive to. Um, <coughs> and that makes it much more useful. So your question then is how do you build that, that amplifier, differential amplifier? Well, that's the stuff of kind of e electronic engineering students the world over in their first year. Um, you can use this device called an operational amplifier. Well known, well tested, um, very easily available off the shelf, and you build exactly this circuit. So you got three connections on the device, so the frequency input, it's got an output, and then what you do is you add in this thing called feedback, which gives you um, again an amplification ability. And you can set these resistors so 50 times gain. I set this one here to uh, 50. 1,000 ohms, and this one to 1,000 ohms, <coughs> and you find that technical with absolutely nothing to do that. And then what we do is just take that trip resistance part of that power supply. The downside to this is, when I started just thinking, well, shall I build this circuit, since we make boards based on it, um, you find out weird things. Like the fact you've got four resistors here, that's more cost to the assembly of your, of your measurement than it does to buy the operating amplifier. Um, and that's because assembly, the robot has to now go and go to four more places and got four more resistors and we've got two different values and the natural cost of making it. So if you wanted to mass produce this, there's a way forward to that attractive problem. <coughs> and it's uh, annoying, breaks on layout, doesn't look so pretty, all sorts of things. Um, so we can actually buy off the shelf dedicated current sense amplifiers. They're designed exactly for this application of processing the processing system and they have fixed um, amplification. And there is indeed one that gives 50 times amplification. Uh, we use ones from Maxim. They produce a range of these devices with calibratable ranges um, and one or four different inputs, different inputs. So you can measure it to four power supplies at once, and that's what I said our boards do. <coughs> and you do all of this, and it's a relatively expensive chip, but it's nice and The devices have this fundamental limit called bandwidth, which says, what is the fastest that I can amplify? What's the fastest signal that I can amplify? And these devices actually have very low bandwidth, and that's because they amplify so high. Um, and they go up to about 2 megahertz. And what that means is that you can't measure accurately a signal that's really passing a million times a second. In these devices. You use these devices, there's no point in measuring faster than that, because they don't have bandwidth that can't amplify and what's going to say. <laughs> There's no point in there? There's, well, not quite no point, there's little points in that because the what you've done is you've created a system where, where go back to this diagram. So you've got a system here, if this can measure very, very quickly, you've introduced in the middle a weak link. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of pass all of the information from the resistor into the ABC because it has this limit. And so the ABC can go faster and faster faster, but there's no more information to be got. Uh, so it's, yes, it's analog, yes. So it's a, it's a function of the transistors that are building into that device. Uh, if you drop the amount of amplification, you can push that up. And this is a trade off. There's a fixed trade off between how much you want to multiply the voltage of your signal and how quickly you can do that. And so if you drop that down, and that's why there's a range here. <coughs> because there's a range of amplification between 20 and 100 times. And if you amplify in 20 times, you get 2 megahertz. If you amplify 100 times, you get 1.3 megahertz. So you have to choose that. So you choose where you lose the information in the ABC or the <coughs> <coughs> So for this boundary, uh, let's say we have some uh, circuit that we are to pass the higher frequency. Uh, yeah. And we uh, lose some information for that we can use that. You'll lose, yes, absolutely, you'll lose that information. Is that, uh, is that the power of the So there's a really good question about what information is in this point. Um, one of the things that happens when you, when you pass a benefit is it smooths the signal, and it fundamentally smooths the signal. So the total, if you were to take an infinite number of samples of the output, you'll get the same representation of the total energy. But what you don't know is the shape of the curve. So you don't know when it went up and when it went down, but you will see the total used. So you lose. In the ability to say, well, it was that part of the loop that took a lot of power, or it was that part. You'll just say, my program took this much. And that will still be an accurate answer, but you can't tell where in time. It, it will measure 
and it will measure, the power readings will be different, but the integral, the total energy will be the same. So your energy figure is still accurate, but you, your, your when it happened is less accurate. And that's something to be really aware of. Uh, that also means that you can do maths, you can do statistical correlations over repeating measurements to try and gain more information, because the total is always the same. <coughs> but that's, that's an annoying since it's worth it way. You can buy a more expensive device to push away the limitation and build a more expensive circuit. You can always do this, uh, almost always do <coughs> And the other thing, the problem is you have with this device is the, the analog digital converter part um, has a built-in error, because what you're doing is you're taking a continuous quantity, which is voltage, and you're producing a binary value, which has a fixed number. Um, so you, you can have error, um, and that's almost always half of a bit. So when you take a, a value out of measurement, you should always basically discard the least bit, or at least average it over the multiple cycle, because that will essentially randomly flip, just depending on exactly how your LEC operates. Like. <coughs> There's a minimum conversion time, so the ABC puts a speed limit into the measurement, and that means you can't pass, measure faster than the ABCs. Um, they themselves display power, so there was a question earlier about right, that, that gives bias in the sample, you've got to remember to take that off. And uh, I find the one, they generate quite a large amount of data, even a small, quite slow ADC. Uh, excuse me, how do we have to interpret this precision? This, uh, Thank you, sir. Half an LSD, so we see significant. Bit, sorry, bit, bit, bit. Uh, bit. Listen, bit. So you've got 12 bit representation, the bottom yeah. bit is 0 or 1 plus or minus 0 0.5. Yeah, I know, I know, I think it's a capsule for me, so... You're right, sorry, yes, at least some bit. I don't want to have Give you an idea, if you've got a device like this going at a million samples a second, you generate 12 bits in every sample, sample of registered program data, and you then can max out a USB one. One of the problems we have with this device is that embedded devices <coughs> should be not great at doing USB, so getting the data off here, even though it does USB 2, it can't max out USB 2, we don't have the ability to get off all the data that we can measure um, from our devices, even though we only measure these times. So that's well worth remembering. So what you can do is you pre-process data, you put a processor lying around, and you do that as well. Um, but you do want to say, okay, do I have an idea what's important information? Do I need every sample? And that helps you design your software. Any more questions? <coughs> do we need to be concerned about the tolerances on the shunt resistance? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So the, the power consumption measurement you get is directly correlated to the resistance, very important resistance. So if the resistance changes, then, uh, or is, has a tolerance error, then your measurement is out by that as well. And you can, of course, cut, you can measure the resistance in the stone core in a multimeter, so you can have it. Um, for this reason, again, <coughs> shameless book, in the open source uh, design, we specify some very tight tolerance resistance, 0.5% resistance, so to minimize any differences. Um, so the truth is it's something that zero point one master power. What about you say? What about non-linearity of the uh, mm -hmm. ADC you could take into account as well? Uh, that, yeah, that, that will be specified in the data sheet. Um, where, where that happens, typically they are internally calculated to produce a linear output um, when you get the binary representation. Mm -hmm. But these kind of things depend on the ADC that you use and you have to read the data sheet. It's always a caveat. So then you normally get a, a, a linear uh, binary representation, even if it's not a linear response to the itself. <coughs> okay, so we've got some other limitations. So uh, not, everything's not great, right? And um, one of the problems was we had to connect in this shunt resistor into our devices, um, which means we either need a board that has one, or we have to do some desoldering followed by some soldering. So what we have to do is remove one component to make space for soldering some wires, and then add in whatever you took off, plus, you have to remove this back. To give you an idea what these kind of things look like, this is a board we have back in our lab. This is a power supply, it's a one volt power supply. We've got a chip here, it's a power supply chip, and capacitors, it's a switch mode power supply, it's got a conductor in here. Here's the little shunt resistor in this. I've magnified this quite a lot, so it's a really tiny device. But here's a board and it's got little two little pro points and you can put you know, a multimeter in here or you can put the um, bit of update circuit I've just shown you across these two sockets and then you will get the main one. <coughs> and so that's nice. And the fact that most devices don't have that, so the Beagle, Beagle Bone um, White doesn't have it, uh, but you have to use dab hand for soldering, and I think you see this one on the stand if you want to. And in here there was some power supply components that have been removed, replaced by a bunch of wires and a bunch of glue, and then everything is connected in uh, externally. 
Uh, so if you want to do that kind of modification, you need to know which components to take off. Because some of you take it off, it's going to break. Some of you take it off, it won't break. And you need to know where to connect that into. Um, and there's two popular types of power supply, and they have different components. <coughs> um, on small, cheap devices, you typically find this thing called a linear power supply. Um, it's good because it's very cheap um, and very small, but it's pretty inefficient, so it's not used for large devices and get too hot. Um, and those devices use things for switchable power supplies, that's the kind of power supply you've got for your laptop, and it's much more efficient. Uh, these things here, depending on the voltage you put in, might be as bad as 20%, 30% efficient. These ones here are normally 98 plus percent efficient. <coughs> So let's look at the linear one first, simpler than the two. Um, what it does is it says, okay, I've got an input voltage and I've got an output voltage, that's a voltage for the microprocessor, and I'm going to change the difference by just wasting the energy. Okay, so you put in five volts, you've got one volt, it just wastes four volts with it. It's, uh, and it's really a, a big time cost. So there's a representation, it's a transistor, it changes its value depending on the input voltage you put in there. Um, it's a regulator, and you get out whatever you bought on the package. The package normally specifies 5 volt output, 1 volt output, whatever you get, you get out. <coughs> So you get a voltage out here, 5 volts goes in, 1 volt might come out, and then you add in the sugar resistor for your motion. Well, you drop the little voltage across that, maybe 0 0.05 volts, <coughs> and that means your processor actually now sees 0.95 volts instead of the 1 volt it was expecting. The processor will still work, but you're not running it at the same condition that you were thought you were. You thought you were measuring it for one volt performance. And as Jeremy mentioned in the previous talk, if you drop the voltage, it becomes more efficient. So you've actually helped you know, the energy of the system by doing the measurement. Again, you've disturbed the system. <coughs> um, now, with switchboard power supplies, we can get away from that. <coughs> because the regulator has this notion of feedback, it can measure the output, and it just for it. <coughs> and so there's a massively simplified uh, diagram of a, of a switch mode power supply. Um, but the switch mode power supply is made by having a switch, a transistor, in series with an inductor. And this switch goes up and down really, really quickly um, to provide power this way, which is then stored temporarily in the inductor. And it looks at the output and says, do I need to connect the power supply again? Do I need to connect it? And if the voltage is too low, it connects the power supply, if it's too high, it stops. <coughs> And so this thing goes up and down, comes down in times a second, and there's a measurement point where feedback comes in to decide whether to close the switch. <coughs> so you've got the sugar resistor in. As long as you put the sugar resistor before the feedback, and it could be in either order with the inductor, and in either order with the switch, then you will get feedback that ensures that the voltage across there is adjusted for automatically. So what that would look like in the same example, his five volts goes in, oh gosh, my end button and my um, page down button. It's five volts in. You'll get five one volt out if it's a one volt power supply. And the reason is because it's, because the power supply will increment on the other side of the sugar system and um, automatically it will adjust it. So the sugar system will be there. That would be one volt. Since it's there, it notices that the voltage changes across it. So now you can bring your processor at one volt, which is potentially what you want. So it's better from the point of view of being able to make a more accurate measurement for the conditions that you want. <coughs> and then my last thing on this really is how fast can we do this? So we talked a little bit about the amplifier, <laughs> but there's another part of my system. Once I have a power supply and a resistor and a capacitor, which is at least the input to my um, processor, but normally also another capacitor to make a nice stable power supply. What I've built is this thing called an RC charging circuit. And they're well known because they take time to charge in the back. And they've got this wonderfully simple relationship, which is the amount of time taken to change the voltage on that capacitor, which is your power supply output, um, is related to our time scale. <coughs> and what that means is at the, at the point where you're coming out of power supply, the voltage can only change so quickly. And it changes the maximum that speed. And so that limits the rate at which the power supply voltage will change. You'll see if it changes that. Regardless of if the microprocessor suddenly connects together power supplies and says, I want infinite, I want infinite current now, you won't see that for a some time on the measurement. You will see it eventually, but you won't see it straight away. And that means that you can then push through values. So this is a common linear power supply. If you push through these values, what actually happens is there's a limit to the physics of the, <coughs> the connection. It's not, not no longer the amplification. And it turns out that you buy that 
very popular now to shell past the regulated five volt power supply, you will never see a response more than 1.5 microfarads. That means in the signal you wanted to measure, there wasn't anything more interesting than running at that speed that you can see. So even if you had a 500 megahertz processor, you won't be able to see its power supply changing to 500 megahertz because of the damping that the power supply is doing. <coughs> so this actually means we've got a sort of thing on negative. So it means you need to measure the low point measure in fast in three megahertz in this scenario, which you won't see. There's no information about it. <coughs> So that's worth bearing in mind, because otherwise you think, well, I just buy a very expensive oscilloscope, and I can measure anything I like. You actually can't, you would never be able to measure it at 5 megahertz. <coughs> um, what that means for your output, though, is that if you say, OK, here is my processor, running at 500 megahertz, running instructions, with that kind of power supply, you'll never be able to resolve closer together than a block of 300 instructions. So you won't be able to say that app would take my energy you'll be able to say, that block of 300 instructions. No, let's go and have a look at it. And this really is. <coughs> so if you want better, you've got to re-engineer the entire power supply to the microprocessor for the package. <coughs> and so whilst this works for a slow device, so at a slow device, I can say, this is working It's running at one megahertz. I can do that. Five minutes, I'll never be able to do that. So again, graphically, you'll never get out this kind of level of resolution of saying, it's this line of my assembly code that took the power. <coughs> well, you might be able to say, well, maybe it's that block of code. And maybe it's got that out of So that's what we're looking at with these kind of measurement devices. And I have, I think, one minute left to just show you what these designs look like when you look at these screen. You want to play more with these designs, you have a workshop session, you can come and even take them home. <coughs> um, so we've got this device, and it's an open source design. Here's the link, you can download it. Uh, we use open source CAD software, and you can download the design of the CAD software, generate files and send them out. So uh, four channels, six megs per second, so it would, do, it would measure accurately everything we've seen today. Full bit resolution, um, and this is what it looks like. You zoom in using my hand. We've got, this is the amplifier in the middle, the biggest part of the device. We've got a big selection of different trip resistors that you can insert by connecting to the short. So you have to do some soldering. All you have to do is connect your power supplies into some pins here. So you have to break the power supply trace on your board, take two wires out, and push them to here, and here and here, and then that's it. <coughs> then you set some jumpers, that will match the jumpers we've got, um, and this will then do all of the work that is designed you know, to be carefully controlled. This thing plugs into um, and a cheap arm evaluation board. Here, that's what, a nine euro board. You can buy it to shelf from RAS, Farnell, any of your favourite companies, um, and that then collects the data and has the ADC inside. I think that'll leave it to my last slide. Um, this is what comes out. And you play again, this in the workshop. Um, there's, we have software that takes the USB and you can, can visualize the output of that measurement device on a PC, a laptop, and here we've got the current measurement going through one probe point, voltage measurement, and the power. And what you can see here is we weren't doing anything on the target processor, and then we do things. It shoots up and then it starts flipping around. And that's the block space. So I think with that, I'll just uh, skip to the end and say <coughs> you know, it's very useful to be able to do this because now you can say things like, I can say a block of 300 codes on a 5 megahertz processor. Here's my block. That's the block that is taking energy. Let's go and re-engineer that. But a slow processor, I can say it's <coughs> We've got the open source design. Please download it. Take a free kit away today. Uh, you may need to do a little soldering at the level of just breaking a track, soldering one wire, soldering another wire, and then you can put it into our Simply as possible. We've got hands on workshops starting at 12. So, with that, I'll leave.